we're excited to be talking about pancreatic cancer and to be talking about the University of Michigan approach to treating pancreatic cancer, diagnosing it. Um, pancreatic cancer is the fourth uh, leading cause of, of cancer death in the United States um, among both men and women. Um, the incidence of pancreatic cancer has been increasing in the United States since 1999, as has death um, from pancreatic cancer. Um, we estimate that there'll be about 46,000 cases of pancreatic cancer in the United States this year and about 39,000 deaths. So almost everybody that gets the disease dies from it. Pretty dismal uh, outcome from the disease. Um, one of the things that has been known for a long time about epidemiology and pancreatic cancer is that smoking is a risk factor. When you look um, across multiple studies, the attributable risk from tobacco use in terms of how much of death is related to smoking in pancreatic cancer, it's at least 20% of cases. And research that we've done here um, uh, in cooperation with the University of Pittsburgh initially um, showed that uh, there was an earlier onset of pancreatic cancer in smokers and in drinkers as well, and that the combined risk between uh, smoking and drinking was additive, such that when patients drank and smoke both, that the age of onset was 10 years younger. So dramatic decrease in the age of onset for pancreatic cancer if you were a drinker and smoker. Um, but if you stop drinking and smoking, uh, the risk decreased after about 10 years. So some good news if patients stop drinking and smoking. So some hope there. Mm -hmm. I think it's probably also important to mention the link between diabetes and pancreatic cancer. I don't know if you're going to mention that, Michelle. Um, but it's a kind of an interesting um, link in that uh, we know that there's something that happens when people get pancreatic cancer that they often present with diabetes. Even up to two-thirds of patients will develop uh, diabetes and then later um, often several months later present with the symptoms and signs of pancreatic cancer. But we now also know that patients who have long-standing type 2 diabetes are at increased risk for pancreatic cancer. And that may be one of the causative factors for the uh, increase in pancreatic cancer that we're seeing in the population. One of the other risk factors that uh, has become known through research is, is familial risk factors, and uh, patients that have multiple family members with pancreatic cancer seem to be at an increased risk for pancreatic cancer. There's genetic um, influences, and that's something that is undergoing a lot of research right now, and I know um, genetic research is something that's a really hot topic and something that you're looking at. Uh, sure. Andy, do you want to talk more about that? Yeah, so we know that pancreas cancer runs in certain families. Um, and that suggests that there are genes or mutations that are handed down from generation to generation that confer this risk. And so we're just now gaining a handle on what those mutations, what those changes are, so that we can come up with better tests to figure out whether siblings from that family or, or, or kids from those families will be at risk down the road. And so we're, we're at the, we at the University of Michigan are developing multiple different testing strategies to try to evaluate risk in patients um, in whom fail, uh, pancreas cancer runs in the family. Are you using blood? What kind of substances are you looking at? Yeah, so we're using a mul multiple different platforms to try to see whether or not we can find these needles in a haystack. Uh, we're, we're looking at peripheral blood, um, blood from, from your arm. We're also looking at biopsy specimens from endoscopic ultrasound, which Dr. Anderson can talk more about. Uh, we're also looking at um, different constituents within the bloodstream uh, that, may, that may tip us off as to whether or not risk is involved in these patients. I think an important point to make out is uh, to, to bring out is not only is a family risk of other members of pancreas cancer, but other cancers can be associated with pancreatic cancer, and it's important for people to understand that. Some families with breast cancer can be at increased risk for pancreatic cancer. Some families with colon cancer, melanoma, those are some of the other cancers that can be red flags to have a link um, to pancreatic cancer. And one of the um, things that we've really focused on in our multidisciplinary clinic is to embed uh, a genetics counseling team 
for all the patients that we see in clinic, which I really do think should be the state of the art in the evaluation of a patient where we get a detailed family history to make sure that if there is any risk uh, that's genetic in nature that those patients will go a comprehensive evaluation and their family members will be counseled. Yeah, right now, currently, 80% um, of patients will have metastatic disease at the time of diagnosis. And as we all know, advanced cancer is associated with very poor outcomes. In this case, in, our, in pancreas cancer, folks live on average about six months after the time of diagnosis, mostly because of the metastatic disease. And what, we're, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to identify this cancer long before it's metastasized, and perhaps even long before we can pick it up on current clinical testing. So that's where some of, some of our technologies are hoping to, we're hoping that some of our technologies will, will come to bear in that respect. So that's something that's really exciting that you do, Andy, and that's with the pancreatic cancer stem cells. So that's something we hear about in the news all the time about stem cells, right? So what's a stem cell? Well, I think Dr. Simeone could, could probably answer that best. Well, um, uh, Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, I, you know, we're pretty excited about that work. We discovered um, in pancreatic cancer that not all cancer cells are the same, uh, that there's actually a small subset of cells within pancreatic cancer <coughs> excuse me, that are the drivers for the cancer, that are key to resistance to standard therapies, but importantly, that those cells seem to be responsible for metastasis. And we did that work uh, initially with human specimens but the really cool thing is Andy validated that concept in genetically engineered mice. And maybe, Andy, you can tell them about that nifty mouse uh, model you created um, and what that showed. Yeah, so it turns, out, it turns out it's very difficult to study pancreas cancer in patients because by the time we find most of these patients, there's advanced disease. And so um, colleagues of ours have developed genetically engineered mice, mouse models, or mice in which we have been able to express two of the most common genetic mutations in human pancreas cancer, in the pancreases of our mice. And when you do that, they get pancreas cancer that looks very similar to what we see in humans um, in about four to six months. And so by following these mice from birth to about four to six months, we could then follow the natural history of this disease. And what we've been able to find is that during the natural history of this disease, we find an expansion of cells in the pancreas that are not only cancerous, but may also have some different properties that Dr. Simeone was alluding to that make them look like they're stem-like cells. Um, and we're finding these cells growing in the pancreas when histologically they may not really resemble invasive carcinoma. So it, makes, makes, it sort of explains why um, this disease is so hard to treat and so advanced by the time we, we find it. So in an ideal world, in the future, we'd be able to take something like that, that technology, and, and use that to screen high-risk patients, maybe mm -hmm. patients that have family histories or something like that, and detect cancer early. Yeah. And at an early enough stage to um, diagnose it and intervene before it's too late and yeah. patients die from the disease. Yeah. We're actually doing that right now on a research protocol basis, right? Yeah. yeah. Using the mouse model, we've been able to identify several potential biomarkers, which may tip us off as to whether or not there may be early disease in the pancreas that we can't necessarily pick up on a CAT scan or MRI or an endoscopic ultrasound. And so this is the study that Dr. Simeone has been mentioning, uh, clinical trials where we're testing these biomarker blood tests to see whether or not we can pick up cancer before we, could really, we, we can really diagnose it using current clinical testing. Patients uh, usually come to the surgeons um, and see Dr. Simeone over here for uh, possible resection, and we end up getting our CT, uh, triphasic pancreatic protocol CT, um, which is really essential uh, for all these patients to define um, the extent of the disease. The, um, University of Michigan, we have developed our pancreatic protocol CT. We, we use uh, 0 0.75, millim 0 0.75 millimeter uh, sections and are better able to delineate um, the um, extent of the vascular um, uh, proximity um, or invasion um, to define whether this is a resectable disease or a borderline resectable disease or a locally advanced. 
This is essential because only truly the borderline resectable patients are candidates for uh, neoadjuvant therapy. Uh, the practice for neoadjuvant therapy uh, varies between institutions um, uh, and also varies in terms of what regimens, um, uh, both chemotherapy and or radiation that are employed across different groups and across different institutions. So at University of Michigan, we uh, typically um, uh, use the uh, NCCN guidelines to define uh, the borderline resectable patients. However, we've tweaked it a little bit in, um, to allow more homogeneity of the patients um, that are candidates for uh, uh, neoadjuvant therapy. The rationale for the neoadjuvant therapy um, can be thought of in a few um, uh, different ways. A folks who've uh, got um, pancreatic cancer, as Andy mentioned, is mostly um, systemic disease. Even though if we know that it appears to be uh, localized to the cancer, in most of those patients there is cancer or circulating cancer cells that we can detect. And Andy, Andy's project is, uh, one of his projects involves uh, isolating circulating um, pancreatic cells um, uh, that he can more um, discuss later. The systemic disease um, is what determines um, the ultimate prognosis of the patient and hence giving therapy um, to chemotherapy to all those patients is necessary. And only 50% of patients who undergo resection end up getting chemotherapy. Therefore, it's very essential that folks who've got uh, borderline resectable patients get chemotherapy and maybe neoadjuvant therapy is, a, uh, uh, is the right answer for those folks. Second, folks, the uh, folks have, uh, patients have who have R1 resection that have microscopic margins positive after surgery have a very poor outcome. So it's essential that we do not take those patients for surgery before uh, we've exhausted our resources to, um, uh, to make them as clearly resectable as possible. And I don't know if anyone wants to else chime in. So, well, yeah, well, maybe I can chime in um, because we actually see a lot of these patients together, uh, patients that maybe don't have overt resectable disease, but may have involvement of major vasculature in the area, which can involve the hepatic artery, the superior mesenteric vein, even superior mesenteric artery, and together collectively at our multidisciplinary tumor board. Um, we all evaluate very detailed images and make a decision about which category the patient might be in, be it surgical resectable category or borderline category. Now, what our goal is when someone has borderline disease, it's actually to try to give them the best chance to have a resection with negative margins. And so we have to make decisions about what is going to be the best opportunity for that patient. And often it is treatment up front with therapy that will help shrink the tumor, potentially, and to control any circulating cells that may be in the body. Sometimes that's with combination chemotherapy. Sometimes it's with new drugs that we're trying on the basis of clinical trials, because we know that while chemotherapy may be helpful, that there are probably going to be more, um, uh, uh, more effective <coughs> drugs that we need to find. And that's an active thing that we're working on here is actually to have clinical trials for patients in exactly that category to try to minimize any circulating cells and also more effectively shrink the primary tumor. So we do see a lot of patients who get treated with therapy up front with the ultimate goal of resecting their tumor with negative margins. And oftentimes patients will, will go through multiple different therapies on the way to potential resection. So we'll start off with one very promising cocktail chemotherapy, and they might have a little shrinkage, but the surgery 
might still look difficult and then we either might move to a different chemotherapy or add in a little radiation as well. Again, with the, really the end goal of getting a complete resection and getting yeah. the best outcome. So, so you mentioned the NCCN sort of standard, and, and just for me, because I don't, being a gastroenterologist, I don't really treat them with the drugs. What are the standard drugs for, what's the NCCN standard drugs for chemo? There are only a few clinical trials that have been done uh, in borderline resectable pancreatic adenocarcinoma, and the reason is because there is, this is only a very small subset of patients who present with pancreatic cancer. It's very hard to accrue patients on a clinical trial. We have currently at U of M a clinical trial that uh, allows us to give a three-drug combination called Fulferinox, followed by um, gemcitabine-based radiation. And we are trying to uh, find out whether this is uh, a protocol that can become standard um, in the future. The the other regimens that exist out there, apart from the Fulferinox combination, are gemcitabine and abraxane, or gemcitabine alone. And the determination is made on the basis of the uh, patient's age, performance status, and the uh, ability to withstand the toxicity from each of the different regimens uh, available. Um, as Dr. Feng mentioned, we have um, typically started off with a combination chemotherapy regimen and evaluate the patients with a pancreatic protocol CT every two months and discuss it at the multidisciplinary team board. At that team board, we all sit and make a decision whether or not the patient has had stable disease, progression, or even partial response in which case we decide whether further combination chemotherapy or radiation would be beneficial at that stage. And I'll let Dr. Feng tell us something about the role of radiation in neoadjuvant uh, folks. And I also wanted to touch a little bit upon the NCC and guidelines. These are um, guidelines that are available for many different types of cancer with um, emphasis on both the diagnosis and the treatment. For pancreatic cancer, they're very different than the guidelines for other cancers, and I'm part of the committee right now. For pancreatic cancer, almost every recommendation has a little asterisk that says clinical trial preferred because the outcomes are so dismal and we really need to do better for our patients. And so. Um, that just highlights the need for improving therapy, both systemic therapy, radiation therapy, and, and selection of patients. Just um, it's, it's really crucial to, to, um, to support clinical trials for pancreatic cancer. I think, that, I, just, I think that point in particular needs to be highlighted because data came out last year that showed that nationally only 6% of patients who have pancreatic cancer enter in a clinical trial, wow. which is really an abysmal yeah. number. Wow. And um, I also think it's important to highlight that for every type of patient that we see here, we have um, novel clinical trials to offer. And it's really important for us to make advances in this disease, for us to be exploring promising things that are um, being studied in the laboratory and see how they can help patients. So I, I appreciate bringing that point up. And just to expand on that last point, I think the neoadjuvant uh, pancreatic patients offer uh, a great opportunity for us to test novel drugs um, for the first two or three months or even up to six months of therapy followed by surgery. Uh, that way we can assess not only the effect of the drug on, on the response and survival of our patients, but also um, at the tissue molecular level by uh, finding out whether that drug is effective and should be pursued uh, further or not. So, you know, we were talking about the fact that only 6% of patients with pancreatic cancer enter on a clinical trial, and, and why is that? I, I think it's a number of issues, and, um, but they're really important ones to highlight. One is there's a little bit of a nihilistic approach out in the community that says, oh, you have pancreatic cancer, you know, there's nothing that can be done, and I think that's wrong. I think there are things that can be done. There are a lot of people... Uh, testing innovative new therapies, and it's important for us as a community to work together to tr make sure that we 
give patients those options to, to get new therapies that can be beneficial. Two is this is the kind of disease that you really should seek a team of experts to, for your care. This is a complicated disease. Here you see a panel of five different experts in different areas. Um, there's a lot of information that needs to come into play to figure out how to treat someone's pancreatic cancer most effectively. And so for uh, patients that have the ability, you know, we really should try to get patients to centers where clinical trials are available so that we can work together to make advances in this disease. And we don't, we don't always necessarily have a patient get all of their care here. We can even offer an opinion. We, well, we have patients travel hundreds of miles to come here to be seen, to be evaluated, and, yeah. and get a recommendation at, at the very least. And I think patients benefit from that. I, I totally agree. We are happy to coordinate care with uh, physicians out in the community. But I think, you know, that initial evaluation and getting an understanding of what the state of the art care is in the disease is really important. And what options are available. And then, the, you know, um, the other thing it's important for patients to realize is it's okay to get a second opinion. No physician should ever feel bad if their patient uh, says, I, you know, I really like to get a second opinion from a team of experts. And then, and, and then a follow-up point is there are um, multiple times along the course of treatment where there's a pause in a decision that's being made. Is what I'm um, getting treated with working or not? And if it's not doing what it needs to do, then that's a time to consider all options again. And so, you know, we, we try to consider our program as a resource to people so that they can help sort through these difficult issues. One of the things that I'm really proud of for our program, and I, I guess this is the time I want to kind of bring it up, is that we, we appreciate that patients are dealing with a cancer diagnosis and that they're scared and that time is really of the essence for them. And mm -hmm. we, we have a really good record and of getting patients in quickly and getting them seen. And so I think, at, at least at our center, mm -hmm. when, when we're contacted by referring doctors that want a second opinion in this situation, we do a really good job of getting people here quickly. Yep, I think that's, that's true. Yeah, we've talked a lot about neoadjuvant and a little bit about radiation therapy, mm -hmm. and, and there are some patients that go right to surgery, albeit not that many, but how do you know when somebody should go right to surgery? Yeah. So right now, uh, the only way to cure pancreatic cancer is with an operation. So, you know, that's where someone like myself comes in. But I think it's important to put the operation in the context of the disease. So, as Michelle was alluding to, only 15% of patients who have an initial diagnosis of pancreatic cancer are even candidates for surgery. Um, so, right now, if you have resectable disease, which is defined by a thin-cut pancreatic protocol CT scan, then surgery is an appropriate option. We, we do know, though, even when we think we hit a home run and we resect the tumor with negative margins, that that patient is still at significant risk for tumor recurrence, which can be as high as 75%, with the average time to recurrence about two to three years, even with adjuvant treatment with standard chemotherapy. So what we want to move to in the future is to have more effective therapies for patients who are resection candidates that we can use to treat them first in a neoadjuvant manner to try to kill those, what we know are floating cancer cells in their system and make that surgery more effective for long-term care. The question is, um, what about minimally invasive approaches to pancreatic surgery? How about use of the robot? Where does that come into play in the care of patients who need surgery for their pancreas? And I think we've made a lot of great strides in using minimally invasive surgery for patients who need pancreatic operations. Probably where it's most effective is in patients who need distal pancreatectomies for tumors they have in the body and tail of their gland. There, I think that the quality of the operation done using a minimally invasive technique, the complication rate is low and that operation is safe for the vast majority of patients who need a distal pancreatectomy uh, for a tumor. Now, there are centers, and we are one of them, that are using robots and uh, laparoscopes to do Whipple procedures. But I think it's important for people to know that there is still a steep learning curve using the robot to do Whipple procedures. And 
you really have to have a very experienced team and you need to make sure and check with the team and see what their outcomes are. There are a lot of people dabbling in doing robotic pancreatic surgery and the outcomes that are less desirable are not being reported. So this is an area that I think is still under development and I think it still remains to be seen as to whether using minimally invasive surgery for the Whipple procedure will be advantageous compared to our uh, tried and true open procedure, which now we can do very effectively in patients with, with low complications. But even those open surgeries, um, the best outcomes come about in hospitals and medical centers where surgeons are doing a lot of these operations sure. every year. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I think that's a very important point is it's it, that patients and referring doctors need to make sure that they do their homework and they, they have surgeons take care of them that are extremely experienced in all the nuances of pancreatic surgery and also that the operations are done at a center that should any complications happen, there's advanced teams that can take care of any aspect of a complication that might happen. Right, which which extends to GI and GI, um, ICU and yeah, it's not just interventional uh, radiology right. yeah. and all, all those all things. of those things. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's okay to ask about experience and numbers. I think patients mm -hmm. need to. Mm -hmm. I think it's okay to ask about complications, and those are good conversations to have. Yeah. So I know brachytherapy mm -hmm. and CyberKnife is something that's being used in other forms of cancer. Is that something that we use in in pancreas cancer? Do you ever see it being used in the future? Um, we never use brachytherapy for pancreas cancer, even though it's very popular and very, very effective for other types of cancers like uh, prostate cancer or cervical cancer. For pancreatic cancer, it is very difficult to access the area where the tumor is, and it's actually so close to critical structures that any slight one millimeter um, displacement could actually cause a lot of harm. So we actually typically never use breaking therapy for this. So um, in terms of radiation, there are many um, acronyms that are out there. It's kind of an alphabet soup, just like with chemotherapy with IGRT, which is image guided, image guided radiotherapy, IMRT, which is intensity modulated radiation therapy, SBRT, which is stereotactic body radiotherapy, and it goes on and on and on. Um, basically, there are kind of two flavors of um, schedules of radiation and two flavors of types of delivery of radiation. The two schedules would be um, um, the more traditional type of schedule where we give a little bit of radiation every day of the week in order to add up to a high dose of radiation to the tumor and protect this very close by surrounding um, normal tissues. And that's the type that we use because we can actually get a better um, ratio of um, effect to the tumor compared to the lower effect to the normal tissues to get an overall better outcome better tumor kill, and, and much, much safer treatment. Um, there are other types of more abbreviated schedules for radiation. SBRT realm, which is basically a completely different philosophy of giving high doses of radiation, either every day of the week for five days, or kind of twice a week or three times a week. The advantage of that is schedule, number one. Um, it's much more convenient for patients, much more convenient for clinics, and um, it potentially could get patients to systemic therapy faster, and systemic therapy is very important, although that is really only a couple of weeks faster to get to systemic therapy. The other um, advantage of the SBRT is... Um, um, it, Actually, that's the main. That's the main advantage of SBRT: kind of convenience for patients and getting patients to systemic therapy faster. So the former one is the one that we put the fiducials in for. Fiducials would actually need to be in for anything, and that's the alphabet soup. So the um, the fiducials are for this IGRT, okay. and the reason that fiducials or markers inside the tumor that you're treating are so important is because during the radiation delivery we need to be certain that we're actually hitting the right spot. So as we're all sitting here right now breathing, our abdominal organs are moving up and down, 
and kind of slightly forward. And everybody's breathing motion is different. And our breaths from breath to breath are also different. And so as you can imagine, if we we're trying to shoot x-ray beams from the outside into a tumor that's deep inside the body, without some sort of image guidance to see inside, we, have no, we would have no idea what we're shooting at. And that's not um, advantageous for killing off the tumor. And also it's not safe because there are a lot of normal tissues that are nearby which can easily be damaged by the radiation. So um, Dr. Anderson here and her team have been great at putting in these what we call fiducial markers, which are basically tiny little markers, smaller than a grain of rice, right into the tumor. And that allows us to see in real time what we're shooting at with the radiation. So we can ensure that we're covering the tumor with radiation and not shooting, let's say, the intestine, which is just a few millimeters away. It's so crucial. Yeah, we've, it's a, there was a learning curve. As there as is with, with any anything, procedure and any surgery, surgery but we've so gotten, crucial. you know, I think, pretty quickly. I think one point worth making, and maybe not everyone realizes yeah. it, but there's a subset of pancreatic cancers, maybe about 15% or so, that really don't metastasize very much at all, but have a tendency to just really wrap around critical blood vessels in the area, so they're unresectable, but... Um, uh, they're not really readily spreading elsewhere, and so we really want to focus on local tumor control. And so for these focal, locally unresectable tumors, a combination of chemotherapy and radiation is particularly beneficial. And um, actually, um, Mary and her colleagues have um, been the national champions in figuring a way, the way to optimally give full doses of chemotherapy and high doses of radiation to exactly that cohort of patients such that we can have extended survival in some of those patients. So do you think that that's why, I know our sort of um, philosophy and stance on radiation is very different from Europe. I just yes. came back from Europe, and yes. like one of the questions they asked me was like, you guys why? give radiation, why do you do that, right? Yes. So what, why do you think we're, we're, we believe in it? Why are we successful with it? Right. So I, I think you've um, brought up a very, very good point that it, radiation for pancreatic cancer in many instances is highly controversial. And I think you're right that, and the evidence supports this, that bad radiation is not helpful. In fact, it could very well be harmful. There are multiple analyses of randomized studies that show that patients who do not receive radiation per the protocol guidelines die faster than patients who did receive radiation per protocol guidelines, as is very similar for patients who don't receive chemotherapy right. as per guidelines. Mm -hmm. And so um, even if there is a guideline of treatment out there, we need to make sure that we are really adhering to that guideline and actually even being more specific with image guidance to make sure we're hitting the tumor, mm -hmm. certainly. Mm -hmm. um, in the olden days of radiation, there was no way to see inside where the tumor was at any given point of time. So people would draw marks on the skin and use other what we call surrogates for where the tumor was inside. And several years ago, we um, published a very um, kind of splashy paper out there that showed that the pancreas tumor actually moves around. And without accounting for it, the radiation could be off two centimeters or more, which means the tumor is here and the radiation is here, hitting the stomach instead. And so that um, really kind of opened people's eyes to the importance sure. of image guidance. Since a lot of the tumors are two centimeters, so if it's off by two centimeters, then, then we're not the whole the delivery is somewhere else, good, right? Yeah. Harm, yeah. So. yeah. So that makes complete sense. So that's why it's so important to have this great team with us so that we can make sure that if radiation is used, we can be targeting at the right area. Place, yep. You know, I was wondering, Michelle, um, if you could talk a little bit about stents, because I think there's a lot of confusion out there. What type of stent, in what situation, uh, and sure. what time? Sure. So maybe you could touch on, on that. Yeah, we, we um, get called upon by our colleagues to um, place stents pretty frequently um, in, in the patient that's jaundiced, and um, especially if they're going to be undergoing any kind of neoadjuvant therapy before surgery or palliative therapy because they're not going to undergo surgery. Certainly if a patient is going to be going to surgery very soon, a plastic stent is acceptable. And by soon, I mean within a, a couple weeks. I think that that's fine. But what size? 
I think that uh, I think that a patient deserves at least a ten French stent. Okay. Um, so I still we still see seven French stents being placed. Why is that? Um, I think that some some medical facilities don't have therapeutic scopes that will allow delivery of a larger stent. Okay. Um, and I think that that's a problem. Um, m- most centers have gone to a larger uh, ERCP scope that has a working channel that will permit a ten French. Um, Stent. Okay. So, in by and large, that shouldn't be a problem, but in some cases, maybe people aren't comfortable with that. But in general, a ten French stent should be standard if you're placing a plastic stent. If the patient's going to undergo neoadjuvant therapy or they're having palliative chemo, then or chemo radiation, then they should be getting metal stents, and that's our mm-hmm. standard here. Mm-hmm. And there's data from our center and from other centers saying that patients have better outcomes with metal stents. Mm-hmm. And so, as you guys know, we're using uncovered stents, short. Um, two centimeters or more below the bifurcation of the biliary tree so that when and if the patient becomes a surgical candidate, there's still options for for Right, and then we never have trouble uh, dealing with a metal stent in the operating room. Right, so so. we would like to close with a very positive message about uh, the treatment that is happening here at the University of Michigan and certainly at other centers across the country. Um, It's certainly my hope that the future will hold Um, not only better treatments, but earlier diagnosis. Um, My own work is in biomarker research and hoping to find better um, molecular tools to diagnose pancreatic cancer early. So, So, um, you know, obviously we're all clinicians and we're taking care of patients with pancreatic cancer, but um, a key thing we all do here uh, is we do research because that is part of our mission, being in an academic center. And I um, am extremely optimistic about uh, where we're going with pancreatic cancer. There's now a very concerted effort to um, develop an early detection blood test. And I'm going to let Andy talk about some of his seminal work in that area. But what I can tell you is I actually think we now have um, the technologies to do early detection for pancreatic cancer. We just need to work collectively as a research community to accomplish that. I uh, think we have a better understanding of the heterogeneity of cells within a cancer. They're not all the same, and I think we have better models and systems to develop more effective therapies. And uh, we, as clinician scientists, working with experts in making new drugs are going to make that happen. Uh, I think there's just increased national awareness, especially with the new data, that pancreatic cancer is going to become the second leading cause of cancer death in the United States by 2020 unless we do something about it. So I'm very proud of the fact that we have uh, not only uh, um, the team here, but behind us we have about 50 different researchers working on trying to come up with the basic science solutions to this disease. And um, maybe I'll pass the baton to Andy because I want him to talk a little bit about the work on early detection because clearly you know, that's where we need to go. Yeah. I can say that there is no greater time in the history of cancer research that's more exciting. This is the most exciting time for pancreas cancer research uh, up until now. And that's that's a result of a confluence of events. Over the past 10 to 20 years, we've seen an explosion in technologies um, that have yet to be applied to cancer diagnosis and cancer treatment. And now is a really exciting time to see all this come together. Um, and so that's what we're doing here at the University of Michigan. In Diane's laboratory, she's using cutting edge techniques to try to identify susceptibilities in individual people's cancers, individual tumors. Uh, in our laboratory, we're, com- we're using microfluidic technology to identify single molecules of DNA that may contain mutations that may tip us off as to whether or not a pancreas cancer is present in a patient, but we just can't detect. What about treatment? What's exciting? What's your dream? What's going to happen? So, for sure, there are tons and tons of clinical trials that are available now that were never a possibility even five to ten years ago. And we've been able to target not only uh, certain upregulated cellular pathways in pancreatic cancer, but also specifically develop drugs that target stem cells. We have uh, novel chemotherapy combinations that have already shown recently that have increased survival. 
So using those as backbone and the new biological agents that are coming up, I'm very, very uh, optimistic that we'll be able to improve on the survival for our patients. Um, we offer uh, genetic um, uh, evaluation for our folks, not only for the familial uh, genes that can increase the risk, but also for the genomic uh, alterations that exist inside their cancer tissue. We can target um, some of those genomic alterations through our phase one clinical trials that we have available over here. And our hope is by doing so, we'd be better able to select that subcohort of folks that are, have the driver or mutations to some degree, and t by targeting, improve on the survival. Almost like personalized medicine. That's exactly what we're trying to deliver. Yeah, absolutely. And it's and that really is where, where treatment is today. With um, early diagnosis, we can catch patients with earlier stages of disease and really be able to tailor the treatments to each patient. As we had touched on before, there are some patients who have a real problem with local tumor, and that local tumor can stay there and fester for many years instead of spread in, and we need to be able to tell who those patients are so we can target them really heavily with concurrent chemotherapy and radiation if surgery is not an option. And nowadays, um, this is the technological age. Everybody has iPhones and this and that, and so it's a really exciting time for radiation. We take um, um, new advances from the automotive industry, biomedical engineering, nuclear physics, and um, electrical engineering. We really combine those into really advancing the way that we deliver radiation so we can really um, optimize the cancer um, control rate and also minimize the side effects of treatment so that oftentimes now I tell patients the main side effects of some radiation treatments are inconvenience and boredom. There is hope. There is hope.